Okay, we have a Q&A Friday today. Yay. <laughs> Yay. So here's today's question. I know you probably won't see this. Oh, I'll just get this little one. But wanted to say I love the book. Thanks. <laughs> I can really identify with a lot of the tendencies that you write about. I'd love to hear more about how to manage over-functioning when your love language is acts of service. I struggle with wanting to help make my partner's life easier, but can end up micromanaging. I'm sure I can't be the only one trying to find some balance in this area. No, no, you are not. (laughs) (laughs) Welcome to the struggle. (laughs) Well, that's interesting because when we talk about love languages, isn't it more in alignment with how I like to be loved versus how the other person or how I choose to love the other person? Do you know what I mean? Both. So you do both. So with love languages, the way that Gary Chapman wrote it is it was understanding both how you love and how you receive love. And if there's any contradictions in that or what the overlap is or whatever. So I both show love through acts of service and also like to be loved through acts of service. They're not always apples to apples, but for some of us, they are. They are. That's interesting. Yeah, because I think that quite often what is our love language has nothing to do with what the person we are attracted to or in partnership with love language is. And I would think, and you know, my perspective on loving well is more in alignment with um, our work is to bring ourselves into alignment with how I can love this person well versus like focusing our energy on how we are being loved, right? Right. Um, Mm -hmm. and not to say that like, we shouldn't be loved in the way that we want to be loved, but I think it's more that we should choose what feels like love to us versus I'm going to be with someone who doesn't love in the way that I love and be in this struggle of getting them to love me in the way that feels like love to me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think this is tricky because as somebody who also shows my love through acts of service, I hear what she's saying. Like, I I have to be very mindful of the codependency that can be running beneath the desire for acts of service or to show acts of service or show love in that way. Because what I have to question is, is it a true desire to show this person that they're loved by making their lives easier? Or is it in an attempt to soothe my own anxiety like if I make their if I make them less anxious, then I'm less anxious, right? Um, mm-hmm. If I make their lives easier, then my life is easier, um, and that's a tricky thing to navigate. But also, what you were saying that I wanted to kind of, I guess, piggyback on is being in partnership with somebody whose love language is different. It is a bit of a navigation because I don't want to be inauthentic mm-hmm. and show them love in the way that they want to be loved or the way that they hear love. And that's hard for me and uncomfortable. And like, yeah, all of us have to stretch a little bit in relationships. Like that's just part of relationships, but to the point where it feels inauthentic, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And if I just stay in my lane and I continue to only show love the way that I do, then my partner doesn't feel loved. So there is a little bit of like, I don't want to say damned if you do, damned if you don't, because I know what you're going to say, which is like, you both need to show up authentically, however you're going to (laughs) show up. And then the other person can either participate in that or not. Um, but also as my partner, like I do want to make his life somewhat better and I do want to make him feel loved and I do want to give him pleasure, even if it's somewhat makes me uncomfortable because it's not like the easiest thing for me again, not to the extreme where I'm totally inauthentic and I'm abandoning myself, but there are times where I feel like it is important to kind of go out of my comfort zone for the sake of my partner, feeling good, feeling loved, feeling, you know, valued or whatever. Yeah, it's interesting because I think what I've heard people speak to, um, you know, in the last few years is the extent to which our love languages can be a really clear indicator of what we didn't get in childhood, is, yep. which is always <laughs> the case with our attachment wounds. And so if we circle back to what you were saying, if my love language is, is acts of service, and that is because I felt like I always carried, carried a lot of responsibility and I didn't have things done for me as a child, um, What I think can be the challenge sometimes in love languages, like needing to be filled by an external source is that it it just feels like that, that source of that is like never enough to sort of like bottle the wound and a bottomless pit feeling. Yeah. And I think, how do I get into the space of 
I don't know. Like I'm, I'm thinking about acts of service because I guess it's probably so out of alignment with my love language that I'm like, you know, when you're like, okay, so what does that feel like for that person that that's Which is probably a good like, exercise for you, right? <laughs> I'm like, this is interesting. I'm like taking my mind there. Um, <clears throat> but I think, yes, here's what I see happen so often because my love language is acts of service. I will be in the constant state of acts of service for others hoping that they will reciprocate my love. Now, what happens in codependent tendencies so often is when someone is performing acts of service, the way I experience that is, this is who this person is. I, <laughs> I was married to a person like that. They, they love to serve. They love to do things for mm -hmm. me, right? While meanwhile, that person is like, you're not serving me the same way that I serve you. And I'm getting really resentful here in yep. the scorekeeping of how many acts of services, services, <laughs> how many mm -hmm. times I'm performing acts of service. But if that's not my love language and that's not something that like, like you could do that. That's amazing. I don't really care. <laughs> like not, it's I don't care. I'm like grateful, but it's also not like, um, it's not filling you up. Yeah. It's not my love language. So it doesn't have the same feeling that like my love language might feel for me. So it's a little bit, I'm expecting someone to get the same like energy of reciprocity that they may not feel the same experience of what you're experiencing when you have someone, um, doing an act of service for you. Do you know what I mean? Am I articulating what I mean? Yeah. Also, okay. So I'll give an, I'll give um, a real life example that just happened yesterday. So I have been planning my partner, John's 50th birthday. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we all know any kind of party planning is a lot, <laughs> but mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've been doing all the things and you know, we, we rented this resort for him in Palm Springs and I'm inviting all the people and I'm back and forth with the people who own it, all the things. Right. Mm -hmm. And he had a sidebar conversation with one party in a couple that's coming to the weekend, right? And in this sidebar conversation he had with her, he was like, oh, yeah, bring your kids. Like, people can bring their kids. It's totally fine. Not knowing that her husband had already told me, it's just the two of us coming. We're not bringing our kids. So I've already placed them in a specific room that wasn't big enough for kids because I had to already kind of Tetris the rooms and whatever else. So we got into this like, you're wrong. No, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. Fight yesterday um, around, well, you should have told me that you had already set up all the rooms. And I'm like, well, you should have told me that you're off here having conversations with people when I'm the one that's doing all the planning. So bear with me. I'm coming back to the acts of service here. <laughs> the reason why I bring this up is because I am planning his birthday because I love him and I want to celebrate him and I want him to have an amazing 50th birthday, right? Mm -hmm. And I also know that it's a lot of fucking work. Um, and up until this point, I'm being very honest when I say I have not felt any kind of like resentment that I'm doing this or I really haven't. But yesterday in the moment of him and I head to head basically being like, you're wrong. No, you're wrong. And that was the kind of fight we started out with. I realized, and I realized it through what I said, which was like, I'm doing all this work and I'm doing all this planning and I'm, you know, basically killing myself for this. And like, you're over here fucking it up. Right. Which isn't exactly what I said, but essentially that was the implication. And I kind of huffed away and I was like, oh, that's so interesting. So am I doing it because I want the recognition that I'm doing it or am I really doing it because I really want to do this or can it be both? Right. Can there be a little bit of a mixture of both? Because truly I'm being honest when I say I have not felt any kind of resentment around planning this until yesterday. When he, it felt like he threw something into my plans. And then suddenly I was like, don't you see me? Don't you see all the things that I do for you and what I'm doing for you? And you don't appreciate it. And all you do is throw wrenches into the things that I'm doing for you. Right. Obviously that's not what I said, but that's like the feeling underneath it. Right. So I use that example because I, I think it's actually a good example of like, I am doing this thing for him out of active service because I, I want to show him how loved he is. And yet is the motivation entirely pure? Is the motivation ever entirely pure. I don't know. Um, but I, I can imagine that, you know, this, this person who wrote in, it's like, if you're an acts of service person, <laughs> you can probably understand the example that I've given and, and where, why I'm sitting with it now the next day being like, huh, okay, what's the motivation? Like, what do I want in return? Do I need anything in return? Right. So long winded example, but I feel like that kind of encapsulates this, what you're talking about with your ex too. Yeah, I think it's a fascinating and I'm actually, I love that you brought this example in because I think it's how different things can feel different when there's like a loaded energy underneath yes. what it is. Like you said, like from the jump, you know, when you're planning a party, it's like, it's stressful. It's a ton of work. It's whatever. And I was thinking, 
I don't think so. Like, I remember planning your baby shower and I was like, I didn't feel that energy. You know, I was like, grab things off Etsy. And it's not like, I don't know, like you're probably a lot more detailed of a party planner. So I probably, I don't bring the energy of what I'm doing in an act of service. It's like, but I think- There's perfectionism in this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, sure. I think there's some like the level of pressure I put on myself to like make this a like beautiful event for this person because I love them. Um, I'm trying to think of an equivalent in my love language and it's not coming up, but yeah, I think that there's something in what you just said at the end, like, is there something that I'm hoping that I will get in terms of recognition? Like, it's like, I am hoping in my love language of this person that I will get what I would want from them in return. Um, which ultimately is I will get what I want from my parent, right? Or my family or whatever that original wounding is from. So then the biggest, you know, the kicker here is like, so I, I'm not going to not do things, right? Like I'm not going to not do acts of service for my partner because I do, again, using this as the example, I want him to feel loved and I'm, I'm happy to take this on and whatever. And how do you combat that feeling that comes up in those moments of a little bit of like, I need you to, not I need you, I want you to see me. I want you to kind of like appreciate what I do for you because I don't know that we can get rid of that entirely. <laughs> we can question it. We can sit with it. We can hold it, but I don't think we can get rid of it, you know? Yeah. I I don't know. You know, I think it's, it's such a <laughs> challenging animal in terms of, like I was just thinking of um, my kid's dad basically like planned his birthday the last weekend and he did a lot of things that let's just say I wouldn't have done the way he did them if it were me but then as I started to feel myself irritated I was like and you should have done it yourself if you were gonna feel irritated like I, I shut it down within myself right like um and so I don't I don't know what's what's right like I think that there's something in like I'm trying to bring it back to the example of you and John, but it's like, if this is his birthday and this is about pleasure for him, then how do I sort of say, none of it needs to be perfect. None of it needs to be um, anything other than what it is. Like, is he going to have fun? And that's like, like bringing sort of that like lighter energy back in as I start to feel irritated as we would, as we inevitably will, you know, I don't know. I don't, know how to, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how to answer that question. I mean, yes, ideally I could do that. I don't know that I can, but you know, when this person in the question is talking about it can border on micromanaging, to me that feels like what I would call mothering, right? Cuz micromanaging really just has like a lot of mothering energy to it. Mm -hmm. Um or just parental and also struggling with that. I think how do I do one without it kind of bleeding into that? I think, again, for me at least, it's been a lot of questioning motivation, right? Like I have to be really honest with myself around the motivation for why I'm doing what I'm doing. Is it really in service of the other or is it more about me, right? So micromanaging, mothering, parenting starts to feel like, oh, this actually isn't about them. This is about my discomfort with messiness. This is my discomfort with other people being uncomfortable. This is my discomfort with not being in control or things not going the way that I think they should, right? And so when you can get real with yourself and you can you can honestly answer it like that, then I think you start to be more aware of where your line is of like, I'm tipping over that line into mothering from what is seemingly just like an innocent act of service. Well, and I just want to name that I experience micromanaging is very different than parenting because mm. a parent will do something for their child quite often, not expecting anything in return. It is mm. like the most, I think, <laughs> even though we hate it, like it's quite often like the pure act of service because this person needs me. So I'm doing these things for them out of like pure love. Whereas micromanaging, it is the realm of control. It is like, I don't trust you to do this. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to handle this. And, you know, <clears throat> it's interesting when we think about acts of service, I'm thinking about how much you said, make my partner's life easier. And I think that's beautiful. And we have to, <clears throat> to the point that you just made, really check our intentions. Because to me, when something is out of the realm of love, I am loving you and genuinely, I don't need anything back from you. Mm -hmm. That's when it's love. If I'm expecting something back from you because I do this thing, 
that's when we shift into the realm of transaction. And when we're in the realm of transaction, I will feel some kind of way if I don't get that thing reciprocated back on the other end. And that's not clear. It's like, you know, that's a little bit manipulative. And of course we all do it, but we can name the thing. And that's why we're doing the thing that we're doing. We're attempting to manipulate the situation and we're not being clear with the other person and our intentions underneath why we're doing this loving thing. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, I still would say, though, that like in my experience of parenting, maybe not in the way that I am trying my best to parent, but in the way that I've been parented, um, micromanaging and parenting do go hand in hand. (laughs) Well, a lot of us had transactional relationships with our parents. And to your point, like I feel like we're desperately trying not to do that to our kids. But a lot of, you know, us grew up with, and I want to name that, parents that like you behave the way that I do that I want you to do the way that I do. You behave the way that I feel like you should behave. And in exchange for that, I will give you my love. One, Mm -hmm. that is the origin point of most of our codependent tendencies. But also that is like, there's like a fundamental lack of safety in that. And I think, do we want to perpetuate that in our adult relationships? That like, I will love you if you comply with the way that I feel like you should behave. Like, that's, that's a little bit, um... That's challenging for me emotionally in terms of calling that love. Well, right. And so now we're talking about like conditional love versus unconditional love, right? Ideally, in a perfect world, (laughs) my love for my kid is unconditional, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter who they are, how they show up. I'm going to love them anyway. I'm going to show them love anyway, which is not a lot of our experiences that we've had growing up. Now, I've actually had this argument with people. It's funny. In romantic partnerships, the difference between conditional love versus unconditional love gets a little bit trickier because Mm -hmm. to a certain extent, romantic relationships are kind of conditional because unlike a parental relationship, like if you're going to be a total asshole to me, like I'm, I'm probably, I'm going to love you, but I'm going to love you from a distance. Like I'm not going to be in partnership with you. Right. Um, but if my child, I mean, granted we're talking child, not like adult child. If you're an asshole to me, like, I'm still going to be in this with you. Like you're my child, you know? Um, Now adult children would be a little bit different. As a parent, you might actually have to like set up a boundary and say, I'm not going to allow you to treat me like this, right? So, but I don't know, like what are your thoughts on conditional versus unconditional when it comes to romantic love? Well, to me, love and partnership are not the same thing. Love and alignment are not the same thing. Meaning I got love for everybody. Like I still love the F out of my ex-husband. Like I'll love him forever. It doesn't mean we're in alignment with partnering with one another. And I think that, you know, a lot of times we are making love conditional in a way that I don't feel like is loving. I think that is like the transaction. And there are a lot of people that would argue like, you can't have love without transactions. And I, I just don't, that's not true for me. I think I can love someone and feel like we are not in align in alignment on being in partnership. And so if someone is no longer treating me the way that I desire to be treated, or um, we have the same vision for what we want to build in a partnership, I can love you. If I've loved you, I feel like I'm going to love you. That's just a little bit the way that I feel like I'm built. It doesn't mean we're in alignment and continuing to partner. So I don't necessarily think the love is conditional, but I do think the alignment may be conditional or the partnership you know, would be conditional. Yeah, the partnership might be conditional. Yeah, that's a really good distinction to make because we can all live from a place of love and I can love you but not want to be in partnership with you. And that doesn't mean like the second you fall out of alignment, you have to cut and bail, but that might be a conversation where, you know, um, again, like I'm just using the extreme example of like how someone's treating me. Like you might want to say to somebody in conversation with your partner, right? This is not loving. Like I don't feel loved in the way that I'm being treated and I want to continue partnership with you, but I can only continue partnership with you if it's, you know, a partnership of respect and of, you know, reciprocity when it comes to care and love and all these things. And then that is really what you have to hold yourself, you have to hold yourself to, right? So it's not about I will take the love away if you don't act a certain way, but it's like, well, I will step out of partnership because I know for myself that that's not the kind of partnership I want to participate in. But then that's on you to be accountable for that. Yeah, because I would argue it's not actually loving to allow someone to practice a behavior that is out of Mm. integrity or out of alignment with their highest self with you, right? Mm. So like each of us gets to choose who they want to be, but I don't think it's actually loving for me to say, oh yes, act in any way you want 
um, and practice that with me, that's yeah. not me loving you well. So sometimes to me, the loving response is a boundary. Sometimes the loving um, way of showing up in relationship is this relational container as it's been up to this point needs to change form because I don't think I'm loving you well by continuing to participate in you being in a lower vibration than I believe that you're capable of. And that's for me, to your point, to decipher for myself. Yeah, I love that. That's a really, really good way to almost like frame that kind of conversation. If you feel like you're in that place is just like, you know, maybe the container has shifted and what it was then it's not now. And, you know, we talk about this to death, obviously, where we can that be okay? Like, do we have to hold longevity as the ultimate indicator of success in relationship? Or can we just simply hold alignment and fulfillment as the ultimate indicator? of success in a relationship. And if you no longer feel in alignment, like I don't have to take my love away. I can still love you, but the partnership needs to end because we're no longer in alignment. And does that mean that we fail? Does that mean you're wrong or I'm wrong? No, it just is, you know, and, and can we walk away from it, but still be both in a place of love? Um, even with my kiddo, as you're, as you're saying that I'm thinking, even with a three-year-old, right? Yes, I'm going to continue to show up and love her even if she treats me like shit because she's three and she frequently bullies me because that's what three-year-olds do. <laughs> yeah. But I don't have to just actively participate in it, right? Like I obviously, as a parent, I'm still very much active in saying like, we don't speak to people that we love in that way. Like that mm -hmm. really hurts, you know? And um, and I can instruct her and guide her in how you how you hold people that you love with reverence and what that looks like and what's that, you know, what that sounds like. And so even in those dynamics, like, of course, I'm still going to stick around, but I am still going to give her guidance on mommy doesn't like to be spoken to that way. It doesn't make me feel good. And it doesn't make me want to, you know, in the, in the instances where we're playing together, I don't want to keep playing with you. Like, it makes me want to walk away. I don't want to keep playing with you if you talk to me like that, you know? Um, and that is a really good instructional point, I think, for kids to hear. Yeah, I think children are often a really good way of framing how we could conceivably meet the other adults in our world mm -hmm. if we were meeting, like, because I think, you know, hopefully we're a little bit more conscious in the ways that we speak to our children versus the ways that we speak to another adult. And what often happens, I feel like for us as adults is I'm only going to meet you in the vibration or the energy that you're meeting me. So if mm. you're not treating me well, then I'm not going to treat you well. Right. And with a child, we would just be a little bit more conscious in saying what you said, right? Yeah. Like, that's not how we love one another well. So I'm not going to participate in that with you. I love you. That love's not going anywhere, but I don't speak to people that way. And I often say this to my kid, I don't speak to you that way. And so I would really appreciate you not speaking to me that way. And that's, I think we have the ability to do that in our adult relationships just as much, just takes a little bit more consciousness, you know? Mm. Well, that was a nice little bird walk. I think we covered a couple, a couple <laughs> points, <laughs> but for language. For the, yeah, to use John's language for the person asking about over functioning, slipping into micromanaging. I think hopefully we gave you some, some thought starters, um, asking, you know, really asking yourself about your motivation and getting really, really clear about your motivation for doing the acts of service and then getting more clear around acting from love and what acting from love really looks like, really sounds like, really feels like, um, and transaction is not love, right? So hopefully that will give you some places to start. Love it.